Okay, so yeah, we're gonna look at eBay. I guess YouTube put me on the front page or something, so there's this, we're gonna have like an impromptu, impromptu session here. Um, okay, so as you know, we've sort of selected, uh, as a group, we've selected internet stocks as our muse to learn about investing. And we've started to look at a few of them. We've made some files and those files are available on our Google Drive. So let's make a file for eBay real quick. We're starting now. This will take, uh, I don't know, probably go for like two hours. I have fun doing these. Got my Bloomberg open. eBay stock trades for $24. I wonder how many shares outstanding there are. Let's take a look. Wow, I have 500 people watching. Eh? That's, that's a lot. All right. So I go to the SEC website, quickly pull up eBay's last 10K or 10Q filing. And I see right there that they have 1.178 billion shares outstanding. So each share is $24. So that means that if the pie has got 1 billion pieces, I just, got a, I just got a birthday cake and it's a huge cake and I could probably cut it into a billion pieces. And if I sold each piece, for $24, it, the whole company would be worth $29 billion. And that's kind of what eBay, one share of eBay is $24, but there are over a billion shares out there. So uh, that's why the whole company is worth $28 billion. And that should make intuitive sense to you. So let's just save this and make sure all y'all get access to it. Now I wonder how much cash and debt they have. That would be very interesting to know. So. Since we're trying to frame the value of the company, the easiest way to reframe that, other than just the market cap, is also the enterprise value, which is the net sort of financial situation at the company. We can quickly look for the balance sheet. Let's take a look. Should be right around here. They did spin out PayPal, which um, is a pretty important sort of concept. Um, but here's the eBay balance sheet on page F1, which is about halfway through the file. You can see they've got about six billion in cash. Six billion. We got another three billion in long-term investments, so call it 10, 10 billion in cash, their cash equivalents. I wonder how much debt they've got. It's like seven billion. Yeah, seven billion in total. So a little bit of net cash, not too much. Market cap and the enterprise value are roughly equivalent. Two, three billion in net cash. So $25 billion company, about double LinkedIn and Twitter, which we've looked at, but much, much smaller than the Amazons and Facebooks and Microsofts of the world, which makes sense. Uh, well, you can't tell just from your visceral understanding of the company, we have to look at the numbers. So let's look at let's look at some of these numbers. Let's quickly make the last couple quarters just so we can get a sense for what eBay is all about. I wonder if they're still growing or shrinking or what. Back in the day, they were a high growth company. I, it was one of the first stocks I ever really took a close look at. I track listing growth very carefully. eBay listings are very important. So let's see. Here's revenue. Well, revenue is flattish. Eight, but about eight billion a year. Kind of makes sense. The, just colloquially, you don't really hear about eBay very much. Gross margins are still as high as I remember them. Let's see, what's that look like? 75% roughly? 79% gross margins? I like to make these lines so I can 
move them every now and then when the quarters move. So I can differentiate between actual and historical. My friend Joe taught me that. All right, let's look at the rest. Provision for transaction losses, that's interesting. All right, so two billion in EBITDA, interest income. I wonder if they hold float. That'd be really interesting. Taxes. All right, so eBay is making two billion a year, and the enterprise value is 26 billion. That's pretty interesting. That's pretty interesting. If you think about that, that's what, 10 times earnings? So they've been making roughly two billion, two and a half billion dollars a year. The earnings have declined a little bit, that, that makes it a value stock for, for you, Graham Dodd, kind of, you know, so if, let's just, for argument's sake, say that earnings drop, well, let's see, it was 1947, so let's say earnings drop 5% a year from here on out. On a runoff basis, eBay could be attractive. Yeah. And let's put down what last quarter's revenue growth was. We can put down gross margin. I guess let's go to the... Q4 page real quick, but I must do the rest of the years. Taxes. All messed up. Let's just put it down to zero right now. 944, 915. My guess is there's some one-time items and things like that that make it hard for us to understand what the true tax impact was. Shares outstanding have been going down. They've probably been doing the buyback. Not that important to look at things on a per share basis, but you know, people do it. I don't really recommend stocks. I kind of teach people how to look at stocks, how to research them. I only, myself, I rarely purchase stocks. All right, so we got our template kind of set up here. Let's see if we can't find the press release that accompanied their fourth quarter. Here it is, that was easy. Gross merchandise volume, so that's a metric they give out that we should track. This is how much was auctioned, I guess, on eBay that quarter. So $22 billion. Uh, we should track that really carefully. Um, active buyer base, $162 million. That's interesting. I haven't used eBay myself in a long time. The website kind of sucks. But revenue is flat. Let's let's look for an income statement. Here it is. All right. Two billion. It's provision for transaction losses. I find it interesting. I guess they have to. They sort of have like an insurance almost that they charge off every quarter. It's pretty small, but still. Keyboard just fritzed out there. All right, here we go. All right, so roughly two billion run rate for net income if you look at just Q4. But I'm guessing Q4 is there's some seasonality. Although if you eyeball it, it doesn't look too seasonal. On a full year basis, Q4 is 2322 divided by 8592. That's uh. 27%, so pretty close to what you would expect if it was the years were even Steven. Let's take a look at the rest. Weird tax stuff going on here. All right, let's look at revenue growth. Check your buyer base number, 162 million. Um, da, 
doesn't really matter. All right, so revenue growth flat. Hang on, I got some some banding to do. I like banding people. All right, gross margin is down here. Put operating margin. It's not that important to track, but for you noobs, it could be worth tracking. Is there a difference between EBITDA and operating income? Sure. Typically, you know, people say they're the same, but you know, it depends on how you look at it. If you typically include DNA, if you typically include DNA in the income statement, then there's obviously a difference. First quarter, 2.075 billion. Let's get into a few more quarters. Maybe we should do a, like a non-GAAP version as well. Cash flow is, look at that, cash flow is, uh, well, DNA is a little higher than than um, than capex, but for cash flow from operations, have been uh, a little little north of two billion. So maybe it's it's close to eleven times earnings for flat flat earnings growth. It seems pretty reasonable. The only question is, will eBay still be here ten years from now or eight years from now in the format that it's in today? And that's hard to tell. All right, let's see. Here's Q3. Does anyone think eBay is gonna exist like 10 years from now in its present form? They'll have to reinvent themselves, I would think. Take a straw poll. what investing is all about. It's sort of predicting the future. You know, this company has to, it trades at 10 times earnings, which means this year they'll make two, two or so billion dollars, and the whole company is worth $25 billion. So theoretically, it should, it has to be here, right, 10 years from now. Uh, in the same capacity, it has to be generating just as much cash flow for the stock to be not a short. Short means it'll go down, or you think it'll go down. So... Tricky, definitely tricky. Yeah, if you've come from the future, tell us, is eBay, eBay, are people using eBay in the future? I think there's probably a strong international business. We'll look at that in a second, because I'm not sure eBay, yeah, we have to, we, it's gonna take a while to answer that question, as you can imagine. I messed up something in these financials, let me take a look. 58, 17. Maybe I didn't. All right. Good. Thanks for running interference, Jamie. All right, what's this? Why is, hmm. Oh, this is with PayPal. This is with PayPal. That makes sense. Okay, why is revenue twice as, as large? It's funny that PayPal ended up being the bigger business when eBay acquired them. It was the other way around. It was a tuck-in. Tiny acquisition, is sometimes we call that a tuck-in. T-U-C-K-I-N. That lets you grow a little bit. It's like a small acquisition you do.
Yeah, so it's the it's hard it's gonna be hard to compare prior quarters and stuff like that given the PayPal um, split. Oops. But we'll throw it in there. You know, eBay will be providing most likely revised historical financials. Okay. So we'll, we'll have to find the eBay only portion, I guess through that. It won't be too hard. So let's go back to the quarter press release. There's some interesting stuff in there. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely God mode on Microsoft Excel. That, that doesn't, being good with Excel doesn't mean you're good at investing. That's the hard part. Getting good at Excel is easy. All right, here's some, here's some interesting information. Oh, look at that, StubHub. Okay, so let's, uh, let's pump this stuff in the model. Huh. Marketplace, StubHub. See, eBay is 63% international, so that tells you something. The US, it's not as much of a US website as maybe we thought. Marketing. Hmm. Active buyers has been increasing. Interesting. 162, 159, The GMV has been more or less the same. That's good growth. Uh, good growth. Here's some gap, non gap stuff. We'll have to reconcile that at some point. Devin Wenig. CEO of eBay. I don't know who that is. Can someone do some quick background research for me on that? Is he eBay lifer? Is he a PayPal guy? They provide some data pre post split. Let's go to their IR website. I've never taken Adderall now. Here's eBay's investor relations website. He was a PayPal guy or an eBay life or which one? You guys are telling me both. 600 people watching. Wow. Good for you. Let's look at Q2, because the Q2 year, uh, yeah, the Q2 still had PayPal. So I wonder if they would give us an eBay income statement. Nope. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, 
Oh, he was a Thomson Reuters guy, huh? He was a pharma guy, really? <laughs> really? That's pretty funny. Let's see if uh, in the in the queue at least they strip out eBay versus PayPal. I'm sure they do it there. Looks like it's uh, here. Two one one six. because of the PayPal split spinoff. PayPal is its own public company, so you know the, the past quarters will show PayPal included, which will make our exercise a little difficult, you know? Kind of a pain in the ass. <laughs> Here we go, 2069. So you can see this extremely flat kind of eBay growth, right? Two billion, two billion, two billion, two billion. Every quarter, two billion for for ten quarters. So hard to say what it'll be next quarter. So we have to do some some more work. So let's say eBay revenue declines by like 2% a year. Is that fair? Or is that too slow of a decline? What do you guys think? spend on product development. That should be declining. I should cut some costs. That debt's going to be pretty stagnant.
Okay. So what this tells you is that at 8% discount rate, eBay is roughly fairly valued. It's amazing we just picked uh, kind of some random numbers and it's exactly what the stock price is. Let's take a look. Cash is, we've got to add cash back. So value is 23 billion per share. That's $19 a share. Current stock price is 24, so very similar, very similar to the current stock price. Um, you know, maybe the world thinks the discount rate's a little lower. I think there's some serious risk. Typically, when you see tech companies flatten out revenue, there's serious risk of disintermediation. They've had flat revenue for some time. Well, let's go back to 2012. Let's we got to take a really kind of psychological view of eBay at this point. Did Carl Icahn fight eBay at some point? I think so. I love me a good proxy fight. All oh, right, still have that split. Let's see if we can just get the eBay revenue. What the heck is Zong? Here we go. Okay, looks like they stopped growing in 2013, but they were actually growing a little bit in 2011 and 2012. So there's no reason to think that they can't grow again. I just have to figure out how, which <laughs> isn't easy. Definitely not easy. A very mature business. Imagine there's some goods that don't lend themselves to being sold on, on Amazon and other e-commerce websites. Eh, margins don't generally go up over time. Let's see if we can mess around with this. Yeah, they definitely would have to not shrink for the stock to be a, a long. Or you, or you could have some super natural sort of faith that the business will exist 10 years from now, which I tend to not be able to have. I don't like situations like that where the market cap um, is a function of stability, especially in tech because you have such such a sort of volatile experience. Although you don't tend, you tend to not see cliffs in tech, which is somewhat telling. So let's see if we can see if we can look into this a little further. StubHub and eBay classifies. Sure. Almost no auctioning anymore. Just uh, fixed price sales. Interesting.
Is eBay classified as Craigslist? Is that Craigslist? I've never, has anyone ever done this, eBay classifieds? This looks like Craigslist, right? It's like a sanitized Craigslist. <laughs> Without the sex stuff. All right, let's see here. Um, uh, I don't know, let's try uh, classes and lessons. Kiki G, what is that? Kiki G. This looks just like Craigslist. Did Craigslist get spun off? I forget. They spent two billion on it, didn't they? They're saying there was growth uh, on an FX neutral basis, so that changes the picture quite a bit. Um, obviously, if they can grow, even for like five more years. fairly valued. Stub hub offsets a little bit of the weakness. As this classifies. Interesting. What I want to do is, is uh, invite you all to welcome Devin Wenig, President and CEO of eBay, um, our first keynote of day two. Uh, Devin, thanks for taking the time to, to join us. I know this is an incredibly busy time for, for, for eBay, uh, and so we really appreciate that you could be here. Um, you know, this is obviously an interesting time to be holding this conference all together with everything that's going on here in the Valley. You're somebody who's been close to it for, for a long time. It would be really I great to hear your perspective on, on where we are. Yeah, first of all, me, thanks for having me. Uh, I know it is, uh, I'm sure, there's a lot of uh, questions about what's going on out there, and I, you know, I don't have any answers. I guess what I'd say is there's um, an interesting perspective on the last couple of years, and I can really just comment on our sector, e-commerce. And what I'd say is there's some really great companies that are getting hit hard, but particularly in e-commerce, it is not hard with funding and with a balance sheet to show growth. It's very hard to grow value. And actually, I think to some extent, it hurts right now. It's hurt our stock. It's hurt everybody's stock. But what's happening is not the most unhealthy thing in the world. There are hundreds of businesses that have been formed in e-commerce in the last three years that I would argue are not businesses. And I think wow. that it takes a cycle like this to clear out some of that to allow more real business. And, you know, it's... For us, it's a painful process, but we've seen this in the internet before. There's been a progressive cycle of riding up and down. And what I say is what usually happens in these cycles is stronger companies emerge even stronger. We saw that after 08. People declared at the end of the world no one was going to survive. And it was actually Uber.
for an Airbnb that came out of 08. Google got stronger. Companies with real businesses did much better when the tide went out. And I don't know if the tide is going out, but it feels a little bit like that. And if it is, I don't think it's the most unhealthy thing in the world. That certainly makes sense. Um, for, for eBay more specifically, though, you've gone through a lot of changes over the last year, with the separation from PayPal and the divestment of the enterprise business. For investors in the room that are sort of interested in starting with a blank slate, what is eBay now as a company, and what do you aspire to that being? You know, I think that what we are now, if we're honest, is a place where the world shops for great value and unique inventory. And our aspiration is to be the place where the world shops first for unique value and great deals, great, uh, great unique inventory. If you step back to the last year when we went through this process of really changing the portfolio, we got a chance to look at eBay. eBay Inc. was a different company a year ago, most notably because the PayPal was part of eBay Inc. And what eBay, the business, was doing was very different. We were really, in many ways, spread a mile wide in the industry, and we were very focused on supporting pieces of the portfolio, including PayPal. You would have heard us two years ago talking a lot about focus on retail be in all things to all people, uh, e-commerce business, thin P PayPal flywheel. And in many ways, I think that worked. Obviously, we created a $40 billion business in PayPal, which is terrific. But when it came clear that PayPal was no longer going to be part of our portfolio, we took a long, hard look at what would be best for eBay. And my perspective was the last few years, and I got a view of what worked and what didn't. There were things that may have worked for PayPal that weren't necessarily working for eBay. And, and the first question we asked is, well, who is the eBay target customer? Why do, in a world where there are great choices, um, companies, there are great e-commerce alternatives, why do 160 million people still shop on eBay? And it's really clear that the shopping occasion is the world's greatest place to find unique inventory and incredible value. And with that firmly in mind, we decided that focusing ruthlessly on that and getting out of everything else was the way to create value for eBay. So the next decision was to sell eBay Enterprise and really double down on our core, and that's our core. So that's exactly what we've done. Hey, attention. You know, I don't, for us, e-commerce is less and less of a meaningful concept these days. It's commerce. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to buy an iPhone in e-commerce. They want to buy a phone or a laptop or a sweater. And e-commerce is just the way to do it. It's becoming a What do I need to buy other than a haircut? So I view it as there's a $14 trillion opportunity. And even though sometimes people connect the dots and say there's only going to be one company to win that $14 trillion, it probably is not going to play out that way. There's probably going to be a few. And eBay is going to be one of the most important businesses that dominate in, uh, in the space that I mentioned, incredible value, unique inventory for the world shoppers. That's where we're going to be great. And so when you look at that, that landscape of companies out there trying to address that $14 trillion opportunity, what is the, what's the, the path that eBay needs to take to get back to where you're growing share in that market, where you're growing with the over, overall market, whether it's e-commerce or just commerce in general? Well, I, first of all, let's address that and then we'll come back to how do we grow faster, because we certainly want to, and that's certainly part of our plan. Um, I don't know what e-commerce growth rate really means anymore, and I'm not sure that's the right growth rate for us. It's easy to say we want to grow faster, of course we do. But again, back to the first point I made, in commerce, you can't talk about growth without margin. And there are two things that I say are relevant to our business. One is that eBay is a matchup of a consumer to consumer sold business which has never grown any e-commerce growth rate. It's a very profitable business, but it's not a high growth business. And that's about a third of our business. And the second thing is that for global scale businesses, we have by far the highest margin in our industry. And, uh, you know, we could grow faster now, but not create value. So I suspect 
fact that somewhere between our growth rate now and the e-commerce growth rate is the sort of efficient frontier of creating value, and that's what we're trying to get somewhere around that. What do we have to do to do that? You know, there's a couple of things, and I suspect we're going to get to that in the questions. But one of them, there are really three things that I'm focused on this year, and that is the inventory. eBay has been an open marketplace. We've sold all the world's things to all the world's people. Starting with the changes last year, we're now very focused on almost thinking like a merchandise or a retailer. We've organized the company now in categories. I have people who wake up every morning thinking it's snowing in New York and we need snow shovels. And that seems very basic, but that's not something the company has done historically. Second thing is the platform. We're under a big uh, technical evolution of our platform, and I suspect we'll come back to it, so I will touch on that now. Um, and then the product experience is on top of it. I think you're going to see eBay's product experience evolve a lot this year, and it's on the back of the platform changes that we're making. The final thing that sort of sits over all of that is you're going to see us talk in our brand and talk more about what eBay stands for. It's an interesting challenge. This is the world's number 38 brand. It's an incredibly powerful brand. But if we went out on the street and asked a thousand people, a thousand would know eBay. Probably 900 would not know what eBay does. They would think that's auctions and used goods, even though that's a small minority of what we do these days. So that's a brand challenge, and it's one that I think we can close. But we'll start to close it once we get better evolution of our product, probably towards the back half of this year. So you, you, you touched on this when you referenced sort of the history with, with auctions, but you, you said GMP is 80% new, it's 80% fixed price, 60% free, free shipping. So clearly that's changed a lot the, from the auction days. How do they differentiate itself? When somebody is buying a new blender with free shipping at a fixed price, why are they buying it from today versus one of the other alternatives out there? You know what's amazing is that Lots of people have an opinion of eBay that haven't been on in the last few years. And when I generally say, why don't you go and check that blender out, most times you will find a better price or a better set of choices on eBay than anywhere else. And I know there's people running right now, and I hope we have a good blender on eBay right now, because somebody's going to say you didn't have the blender, right? But um, that's the fact. And People don't realize that. I think that there are other companies that have grounded their value proposition in logistics. Our view of the world is you can't be bad at logistics. There's a threshold. If you don't get your stuff, nobody's going to shop with you. But if you're good enough, and then you have better choices, better prices, more versions, more variations, that's how we win, because that's authentic to who we are. So we sell a lot of those new blenders and Xbox and iPhones. You know, people are stunned to hear we have a multi-billion dollar cell phone business. We have a multi-billion dollar electronic business. We sell an incredible amount of car parts. All of them are new. And, and the question is why? Why is it because average shipping time is on eBay now three days. That's not bad. And um, we have better choices. We simply have better choices than anybody else. And if you're willing to work through our complexity, which is the problem that we have to solve with the replatforming, you will often get a better shopping choice on eBay than anywhere else. Now, if I can solve the complexity, that's how you start to move the, the growth of that. Well, then maybe it's a good time to, to talk about that. How do you solve the complexity? I, I think that some of the brilliance of eBay's model is also some of its greatest challenge. And the brilliance of it is it's been a friction-free open marketplace which basically said to the world, you know, go sell whatever you want, and that includes businesses. And you can sell whatever you want, however you want. And it's been in this unstructured uh, marketplace for its 20 years of existence. And really what that means without getting into too much detail is we have thousands of iPhones on, um, on eBay right now, and everybody that's selling the iPhone is probably explaining that iPhone slightly differently, even though they're exactly the same product. That creates friction, a frictionless environment, and it's created an amazing selection advantage that we have, 800 million items, which is bigger than anybody in the marketplace. 
but it was complicated. And if you shop that today, um, our answer for everything historically has been search. It's been reducing all of that through search to show you search results, which is fine. We grew a big business that way, and particularly as the business moves to mobile, people's patience, consumers' patience for scrolling through thousands of search results is not very high. The huge change that we're making is moving from this unstructured world to a highly structured marketplace. And that is not something we've historically done. It's something we are doing now. It's not easy and it takes time. But in essence, what it does is it allows us to associate those thousand iPhones together and then collapse them into a set of best choices. So instead of showing you a thousand phones for sale, here's the newest one, here's the best value, here's the best functional equipment or whatever. That to me is authentic to who we are, great choices, but it pushes the uh, simplicity curve way out, and that's the journey, that's the journey to grow. You, you've done this with, with some parts of the, of the business already, you're starting to see some results. Can you give us a sense of, of what that's looked like so far with another thing then? Yeah, I would, um, you know, I encourage people to go look at what we, we're trying to be very transparent about what we're doing and we're showing uh, people what we're building along the way. We did that at our last earnings call. You know, an example is the uh, product pages. An example is you're now seeing simple things like product reviews show up on eBay. That's a question I get a lot. How come you've never had product reviews? We haven't had product reviews because we haven't really had products. And now that we do, um, you're starting to see really rich reviews showing up. You're starting to see us build structured pages. You're starting to see us merchandise better. These are really, I, what I say is they're needles in haystacks right now. They're very small. But we are a very data-driven business. And we don't do anything unless we measure it and unless it works. And so the things that we're building, um, the early indicator that I'm looking for, at the end of the day, there are only two me uh, metrics that matter in commerce, traffic and conversion. And the early indicator is conversion. When we build simplicity into the product, do we get better conversion? Can somebody visiting eBay will simply find that they want to buy it? You know, it's that simple. And we are seeing that. You know, it's not yet moving any of our numbers. In fact, the steps we're taking to transform eBay are marginally hurting our numbers right now. And they will for the better part of the year. But, um, but where the needles are in the data that. I like, I like what, what I, I see, see, and that gives us confidence that as we scale, scale that, we'll get yeah. benefits across the portfolio. One, One of the other strategies, strategies you've talked about on sellers and is more, more of a focus on um, smaller sellers, sellers even individuals in, in, in some cases. How does eBay selection and, and ultimately the buyer benefit from that focus? The amazing thing about eBay is the incredible amount of fragmentation that it aggregates on both the seller and the buyer side. We have 25 million sellers. Um, the next biggest marketplace, putting China aside for a second, the next biggest global third party marketplace has a couple of million. And that, in part, consumers but small businesses, really the poor seller of our seller base. And, you know, a large seller on eBay is a couple of million dollars. And that's out of the marketplace that's selling more than 80 billion. So this is not, we don't have any concentration of supply. Nor do we have any concentration of demand, 160 million buyers. For us, what you can expect is that we make this pivot out of big retail, down the tail, we haven't even scratched the surface of the richness of inventory. When you think about the world, where the world is moving, the fact that consumers now want to shop mobile and not channel. Think about every boutique and artist store and small bookstore and handmade crafter, and you know, there are entrepreneurs, there are millions of entrepreneurs in the world, there are millions in the United States that don't have a digital presence. And the reality is that that's eBay. And I want to put, instead of putting three more huge retailers on to sell commodity goods where I don't compare well to my competitors, I want to put a million small businesses on and have an incredibly rich and diverse and unique set of inventory. So that when you shop, you always check eBay first, because why wouldn't we? We have better choices. That's where we're going to go. 
you've been through a lot of fun from a perspective over the last couple of years. Can you can you give us a sense of you know how that that's evolved, where customers are coming to eBay from, how do you how you attract them and how how important sort of paid market is starting to become in the the evolving place around. It's always been important to us. Let's, let's start with the most important source of our traffic and customer is organic. It comes directly to our apps or to our website. And that's really the brand selling up. You know what I'm saying? Why is the brand valuable? How, how can I measure that? We measure it through direct traffic. Uh, people that don't have to come through a referral, they come directly to eBay. And that's because they know the eBay brand. And that's always been a significant majority of the list. However, a not insignificant minority comes through channels. Those channels historically have been dominated by search um, and, and other channels. Um, that uh, has been a challenge for us for many years. And in May of 14, it became an even bigger challenge. Google rolled out a whole set of new changes. And for us, that hurt that minority of traffic that comes through that channel. There are two things that we are doing to make that uh, traffic and new customer acquisition more robust and more, I'd say, less volatile. If you look at eBay's 20-year history, it's been very volatile. It's sort of a two-year cycle of boom and bust. And we don't, I don't like that. I don't you know. It's, it's hard to manage the business with that. So the first thing is we've got to diversify those sources of traffic. And the great news is there are great choices now that there weren't five years ago. Social being the the the, uh, the most known. So, so we are really putting lots of doors in the water, and you'll see eBay now aggressively um, advertising and exploring different engagement models on Facebook and on Pinterest and on you name it, 14 separate channels. For us, we need to scale that. We're one of the biggest digital advertisers in the world. So, you know, we don't advertise unless we get the ROI, and we haven't yet been able to achieve ROI, so we can't move tons of money into those channels, but it's getting bigger and bigger. The second thing is search is always important, Google is always important, and a lot of what we're doing on persistent structured data that we talked about is really about um, building more visibility into, into search. And just to make that real for people, why is that an issue? Um, without a permanent place to put products, uh, search engines love link equity, they love persistence. They're trying to find things that they think are important in the world, and they rank them higher. We have 800 million items for sale, 300 million of them disappear in the search engine. So to a search engine, that doesn't look very important when it's an iPhone and it's gone, and it's a this and it's gone. Now, having some persistence of product knowledge, we can put a permanent link into search engines and have the inventory used under that permanent link. This is the first time we've been able to do that. So the sum of that is it's slower to build, but we think that once we get there, it's a lot more robust in the face of changes that Google or anybody else may make over time. Good to hear you. The um, uh, stuff up has been, has been accelerating the last couple of, couple of quarters. Um, what, what, what's what's right in that, and, and where does StubHub put the bigger picture of the You know, we've, had a, we've grown StubHub a lot over the last few years, and, you know, StubHub gives me some comfort that even though it could be a long road, you can re-platform an internet business, and you can turn it into trajectory. It's obviously a lot smaller than eBay. We disclosed for the first time in numbers, it does about 3.6 billion in GMV. So yeah, so just something that is uh, a little bit remarkable to point out is the net income of 500 million for Q4. Somehow, there was a billion in free cash flow? That seems a little off. I'm trying to figure out what I'm missing. Might have just been a lucky quarter with all these working capital shifts.
I mean, a billion a quarter in cash flow would mean four billion in net income a year, a cash flow a year. And a twenty-five billion cap or twenty-two billion cap is pretty exciting. Let's see if uh, let's see if this quarter was the opposite. I would wager that it was. Well, maybe. Let's see. Six eighty six two forty two. All right, so you had cash flow below net income here, cash flow way above net income. So ah, it's probably accurate. If you look at capex versus DNA, that's three seventy one capex for six months versus three fifty three for capex. So pretty pretty much the same. Working capital did swing, so. Don't want to take these cash flow statements too seriously if net income is, is reasonably accurate. And Q2 is going to be hard to look at because I don't think we have two financials, or at least I haven't seen them yet. All right, so maybe now we can start to think a little more seriously about about their business. I'm trying to think of a great way to conceptualize it. You know, a lot of the times in finance, you're much better off thinking for an hour than quote unquote working for five hours and spinning your wheels. Um, sometimes it's very hard to sort of conceptualize the company you know, he sort of indicates that his best business, or like, I guess the best value of eBay is the entrepreneur that doesn't have a bricks and mortar infrastructure that needs a platform to sell, right, to sell goods. Now, isn't that what Amazon has as well? Amazon's revenue is growing substantially. Um, if you look at Amazon's last quarter, they grew 22%, while eBay grew 0%. Um, which tells you something. So I'm not sure I buy that. Not sure I buy that. That's also why eBay's 14 times earnings and Amazon is 60 times earnings, but Yeah, but Mercado Libre we're going to look at shortly. You think eBay is like a budget Amazon? Is that the idea? eBay's CEO is not Marissa Meyer. Wrong company. You're thinking of Yahoo. Can't sell single items on Amazon? I didn't know that. Gross market value, 19601, I think we can track that. Gross market value. So eBay sells $80 billion of goods a year, I guess. They don't sell, I mean, they list, they have a listing fee.
interesting. I wonder what the GMV of Amazon is. Let's look at that. Yeah, I know Coke, but we have to Coke transactions, but we have to be a little more uh, uh, impartial than that. Let's do another quarter. Let's fill out the Amazon model a little bit. Maybe we'll get some insights there. Amazon's really seasonal. So it's sort of like, it's funny, Amazon's the brick and mortar retailer in many ways, right? Well, eBay is the, you know, with the listings is very, very skinny. very comparable. They actually sell, if you do the math, eBay is actually selling more goods than Amazon, which really tells you something. Maybe not for long. Amazon seems to be winning the, the battle. So these guys are basically arch nemesis. Nemesis is nemesis. Yeah, if you do the Amazon product sales, right? They actually are moving just as much product. Now they're a retailer, so their margins are are high, but eBay's margins are eighty percent. So it's just funny to me that Amazon is the hundred billion dollar company and eBay isn't the two hundred fifty billion dollar company. Excuse me. Growth growth is a lot, you know. Growth. Uh, Growth gets people going. So yeah, twenty six six one eight. Amazon products eighteen four sixty three. Yeah, it's interesting. Amazon is so seasonally driven that big Q four, eBay doesn't have that. You barely get a bump in Q4 for eBay. Fascinating, huh? They're roughly the same size in terms of goods as goods sold. Yeah, I'm just looking at the product section of Amazon, the e-commerce section, so I'm not including the services like web services. Just products strictly their retail business. It's a very good comparison. I mean, they're certainly losing share. They're certainly losing share. services. I think eBay is pretty popular internationally. We'll get the international numbers in a second. That's a good thing to do.
Yeah, I mean, Amazon's growing 15%, eBay's growing 0%, or they're actually shrinking a little. So Amazon's definitely winning the e-commerce wars. They have all these funky, kind of funky growth initiatives, right? Prime, Prime is one. I get a lot of emails, I don't have time to respond to all of them, I'm sorry guys. Especially lately I've been kind of busy with some legal stuff that I'm focused on. they do to revitalize their brand. I mean, the guy's saying they have to simplify the website, but I think it's more than that. And if you notice, the product growth actually started to accelerate. It's freaking accelerating, which is really remarkable. You typically don't see that. Let's get some annuals for Amazon. I'd be really curious. Yeah, I guess Amazon has the advantage of this kind of uniform distribution center that they can leverage, whereas eBay has has to have a very bespoke approach, right? And Amazon, you get this great consistency, whereas eBay you can naturally kind of get this variability. Here's product sales on an annual basis for Amazon. And you can see quite robust growth. Let's go back to 12 as well. Amazon's been growing like a weed. eBay's been, let's see. It's interesting, maybe they'll both grow. It's definitely not a zero sum game. It's 42 billion. 42 billion on the dot. Always feels like a fake, fake number. You can see Amazon, the law of larger numbers, I guess, but last quarter was 15%, so. Average was 13. Full year was 13. But they, they, it seems like a little bit law of larger numbers, right? It's 79 billion a year, Jesus. I wonder what the entire e commerce sector was. I wonder if that's a decent way to look at it. I'd be curious, like, what Walmart Walmart's revenue was. Let's look at that. In fact, let's make a Walmart model. Fuck it. We're gonna look at e-commerce, we gotta look at all the commerce, right? That's what the eBay guy said. Commerce is commerce. Retailer, e-tailer, that'll make a difference. Plus Walmart can be kinda of interesting to look at. Let's listen in while we do that. Of eBay business, but still, it's not insignificant. Uh, approaching 4 billion, it grew 30% plus last quarter. We, over the last couple of years, we we did a significant replatforming of some of, and we changed some some things about. Them. Someone asked Martin, "Doesn't this get boring?" It's called work. <laughs> it's called work for a reason. Hopefully, you love what you do. So, if you find it boring, then uh, you know what can I tell you? It's not for you. I love numbers, I love companies, I love looking at opportunities, it's fun. It's not always fun, you know? Uh, 
but at the 383rd company is uh, yeah, not always that fun, but it is what it is. The way we show prices. But there's always been a strong link between the two. You know, a few years ago, we basically got out of the ticket category on eBay and refer people to stuff. So we used this huge eBay flywheel to lower, in essence, stuff up the cost of customer acquisition. We've done things like share loyalty together. We've done things like brand and, uh, and share digital advertising together. And it's worked really well. I think some of the biggest challenge right now is they have a very high market share in the U.S. secondary ticket market. And their real mission right now is to move out from that. And for them, their big opportunities are international, where the secondary ticket market is just getting going. It looks a lot like the U.S ticket market did probably 10 years ago. So we have a very small but the vast growing business now in the UK and Germany and there'll be some other things to stay there eventually. And also in primary, they're carefully moving from secondary to primary. You might have seen two days ago an announcement of the Philadelphia 76ers where we're going to handle all of their ticket sales, primary and secondary blended together. So that's an interesting move. I think we're careful about that. We want to be careful that we're doing things we know. We're an internet business, we're not a hardware business, and primary ticketing gets complicated. But what the sub hub is amazing at is they have better data and a better buyer base than anybody. And they will leverage that as a wedge into new adjacent products. Um, the classified business is, is one that has always been a bit of a challenge for the entire industry, high volume, low monetization. Um, business or businesses, or at least have been historically. Is there an opportunity for for to change that? I think we have changed it, and you know, I, I think people were surprised when we disclosed the numbers last quarter. And you did a report a while back that sort of hinted at it, but now that we've uh, now that we've opened the demo a bit, I think people can see that this wow, is Walmart is access. It is a very profitable, consistently growing business. And the reason for that is these businesses tend to be national winners. They tend to be domestic markets, local consumer to consumer selling. They grew up around things that were not easily typical on eBay. You know, they grew up around, well, I can't sell my couch on eBay. I can't sell uh items. So we'll do that through a local classified format. Our business is we've really at scale of one in nine markets, seven of them in European, Montana, and Australia. They consistently grow in the team. We don't disclose the margins, but they're very profitable. And what we've always done and what we'll continue to do is we take profits from the winning markets and we build seeds. And you know, we're in now these nine markets, but we also have seeds in three or four others where we haven't won yet, but we think that we will. And maybe the biggest surprise is the U.S. The interesting thing happening in the U.S. is that classified market appears to be back up for grabs. And it's a mobile only play. And we launched, um, uh, our classified group has launched a mobile only play called Close 5, which is not monetizing yet, but it's really ramped very, very quickly. You know, we, we, we said earlier in 15, we were uh, in, in Q2, we were at 300,000 downloads. The close five app in Q3, we were at 3 million, in Q4, we were at 6 million downloads of close five. And that's the playbook. The playbook is get, get surface area, get vibrancy of buyers and sellers, and monetization doesn't turn on until a couple of years later. So, right now, that's a zero revenue business, but it's a business scale on at least in its user base very rapidly. So we, uh, we do have time for a question from the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone over to you. If there are it's between the Do you see some competing with Uber Rush and Amazon Prime delivery services in any way? You know, I love the garage, and, and I love the, the, the war that's going on on mobile delivery. I love it because that's our philosophy of the world. The philosophy of the world is we don't want to compete in anything that we're not good at. We want to use things and be partners 
the same that can be adjacent and complementary throughout this. You face not a logistics company. And the reality is that um, my view is that uh, the war on local delivery is gonna, it's a war of incremental profitability. It's a war of uh, the incremental cost of delivery because the economics are tough. If we can work with Uber Rush and Shift, which we are working with, and a bunch of others who have better incremental uh, profitability, better incremental margins of delivery, that's fantastic. Our philosophy of fulfillment is the last thing we should do is compete with Amazon or anybody else by putting concrete in the ground. There's plenty of concrete in, already in the ground. What it needs to be is redeployed. It needs to be organized through data, and it needs better capacity and efficiency. That's our view of the world. That's what we use today with our warehouse strategy. We use partners. We don't build our own warehouses. And that's absolutely what we'll do with local delivery. And you've seen it with a few partnerships, and they're more on the way. So I think that I'd rather let that war be fought on somebody else's market, not mine. But the reality is, we have an $80 billion plus flywheel, and we're an incredibly attractive partner to local delivery companies because the, the economics of local delivery are all about utilization. And there isn't a bigger flywheel than eBay to help you with utilization. He loves this word flywheel. If I ever meet him, I'm going to make fun of him and be like, well, it's kind of like a flywheel. You know, I guess the first thing that I would say is that um, I, 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 we meet with our sellers all the time. It's really the lifeblood of our business. And um, sellers who want eBay to win, they're really authentically behind us. Because the reality of it is there are only two global marketplaces at scale, and there's only one that does it directly with them. So they want uh, eBay Amazon. to do well. And so Amazon competes with their own... Out. And, I you know, for me, if I just look at our 16 agenda, what they want from eBay is fair policies that are consistent. We haven't always done that, and we're really trying hard to do a better job at that this year. We're just rolling out in the next two weeks a whole set of new selling standards, which I believe we're very well received. They want great data so they can scale. They want tools that make it easy to list, and they're going to get a lot this year around new listing tools and better data. One of the great things about our marketplace is it's two-sided and the data is self-reinforcing. You know, we're giving people guidance now on these items are selling at this price, sell them here, sell them there. And they want great service. And I want to improve all of those things in 16. And we're getting feedback constantly from sellers and we're trying to get better for them. So you mentioned that you'd rather have more small sellers large sellers, and I'm curious why the one or the other, maybe hat X or whatever with something like Best Buy, and you know, you bring a halo of authenticity and yep. all that, when you have those. When you have the technology, why can't you incorporate all that so I can go, and I can personally make my choice that I'm willing to go there, obviously compete with Amazon and the like, but it doesn't hurt you to have more selection, I would think. No, I agree with that, and it, I'm, I'm actually very glad you asked this question, because it is one or the other. It's where the emphasis is. So we have four or five huge retailers that have built really nice businesses on eBay. Best Buy is on eBay, and they're doing really well. So is Target, so is Media Saturn in Germany, and I can go down the list. These are all businesses that are doing well. However, um, all of our emphasis was on all of them over the last several years. And actually, when you look at more heterogeneous inventory, it tends to be less, uh, offer less of a comparison, be more unique, be more authentic to our brand, it tends to move into the fourth selling of sale. So I think that we are still uh, going to grow their businesses, and there will be other retailers that come on with that. But you'll see the emphasis shift, and you'll see many more small businesses come on, which you have so it's really about where our center of gravity and our emphasis is, but it's not one or the other. Time for maybe one last question. It's one more. Sure, sure. Um,
if you spend $500 a quarter and buy that, why are you back to the capital than looking at more acquisitions? You know, I think that for us, the best compliment that I got from one of our owners... If it was me, I'd be like, bitch, don't tell me what to do. I'm the CEO, don't tell me what to do, my guy. And to the way I started, their days over the last couple of years of running a discipline business feels like, are we doing the right thing? Nobody else is. But, you know, when the, when the market starts to turn, running high margins, high free cash flow, and running a discipline capital allocation policy now is starting to feel better. Our capital allocation philosophy is simple. It's not easy to do, but it, it's simple. And that is, we have high levels of free cash flow. We have potentially the capacity to take on more debt. And we constantly look at um, the, the, the sources and uses to that capital. Uh, we are an acquisitive company, and we will continue to be an acquisitive company. We haven't done much over the last year because valuations ran away from us. Now that they're starting to come back to Earth, you can expect us to be an acquisitive company. You know, my Snapchat. Uh, you know, our guidance this year is uh, over $2 billion of free cash flow. That's a lot with a balance sheet that's very strong. Um, we don't have the use for all of that cash right now. And because of that, we're going to return cash to shareholders opportunistically when we see it. We did in the last two quarters around $550 million. And what we said this year, we believe, within that $2 billion of free cash flow guidance, is that you can expect us to keep doing that or above that, depending on market conditions. And that gives us plenty of capacity to additionally do uh, opportunistic acquisitions that will help our growth strategy. You can expect eBay to be acquisitive in 16 and to return capital to shareholders, and most importantly, to be really disciplined about how we use our capital and when. Probably a great time to finish on. Thank you, Stephanie. Really appreciate you taking the time to run it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Looking at eBay and Amazon definitely, I think, necessitates looking at bricks and mortar retail. I don't think there's a way to, definitely not a way to look at one without the other, which is a little annoying because I think when we signed up to look at tech, we didn't sign up to look at retail. But, you know, that's business for you. Sometimes it takes you in directions that you don't know, and sometimes it can be fun. No reason to cry about it. Just suck it up and do the work. I think it will be very insightful to look at the Walmarts and Targets of the world. So let's, let's look at Target real quick. Now, you notice that, very interestingly, that Walmart has not grown, eBay has not grown, but Amazon's been growing. And I think there has to be winners and losers in this, because commerce in general is probably not growing over time. So I gotta, we got to figure that out. Maybe there's some government statistics that can help us with this as well. I think there probably will be. So you can see you need a sort of game plan for looking at a company. It's, it doesn't happen quickly. You can see you have to lay the foundation, get to know the numbers, get to know the company, listen to, listen to the company talk, hear what they're about. And then slowly but surely, you might be able to sort of figure out where things are headed, but it's not going to be easy. All right, Target. Some people call it Target. So they're 21 billion a quarter. So they're like an eBay. Target is like an eBay or Amazon-sized company, with, but it's full, full bricks and mortar. And it's not growing. You can see uh, it was down 1% year over year. So that's interesting. I'm just going to put in revenue. Just so we go a little faster. So you got all these, two, the two biggest bricks and mortar retailers are shrinking, they're not growing. eBay's not growing, Amazon's eating everybody's lunch. Taking everybody's money. Interesting.
Yeah, Target's struggling. Amazon has that crazy seasonality. Actually had a really good quarter. How about that? Uh, I wouldn't call it really good actually. It's just a seasonal. Just seasonal. You can see, so if you take these four ma massive companies and you see how much <laughs> they're growing, they're not. They're not growing at all basically. 1% growth, not even inflation. 0.8% growth. Let's go back to eBay. All right, so 1659, where's, uh, let's open the eBay. GMV. Twenty one seven nine four twenty zero three four. So revenue tracks GMV, which makes a ton of sense. I mean, obviously, pricing on listings costs would be the only other thing that would make a difference. Man, Home Depot is a huge company, huh? Yeah, this retail rabbit hole isn't going to be fun, but say la vie. Home Depot is a $165 billion company. It's almost inconceivable. That's, I'm also the guy living in his New York City apartment.
Amazon just started uh, turning a profit. Home Depot's diversified? Really? What, brand, what brands do they own? Other than Home Depot. I might be unfamiliar. Oh, the revenue's not much. It's like a target sized, Amazon sized company. bit of growth. Home Depot grew revenue to 10%. That's not right. Yep. Nice quarter. Very nice. Interesting, from holiday quarter to holiday quarter, Amazon grew market share by 1.4%. Pretty amazing. The commerce sector is going 1% a year while, while Amazon's going 15% a year. So it's, it's sort of about finding that niche. I don't know, I think eBay has more longevity than maybe I thought. Let me make some adjustments here.
still fairly valued. Unless they find some big growth change. I mean, it's not, I, you know, it's not, I don't think it's going to grow 10 or 15% anytime soon. And again, the problem is a zero sum game. You know, the commerce sector can't, you know, retail can't just grow all of a sudden. You know, someone's got to lose. So they could take share back from, from Amazon. And it certainly doesn't seem likely right now, given Amazon's the one kicking butt and eBay is the one sucking wind. Commerce isn't going to have a positive inflection point. There has to be zero sum. I mean, that's pretty clear. This is a 16 week quarter for Costco. Have sort of 200 billion, 250 billion of quarterly quarterly revenue, so a trillion of annual spend on these six retailers, and you see the growth is is de minimis. Let's see if we can get one more eBay number. I've got a Marshall. It's a JVM. I think that's Marshall's new. Brand. I used to play on the JCMs when I was a kid. Gross market value. It was adjusted for PayPal, I guess, but it's pretty close. Twenty four eighty five. Market share of Amazon as a percentage of of all kind of all commerce spending is increasing pretty dramatically. eBay's is not, of course. Yeah, it's hard to beat hard to beat the trend. You know, you've got basically one company growing 15% year over year, and every other company basically flat. Here's what that looks like. Costco. Yeah, last quarter, Costco, let's take the average, let's take the average. Year over year growth for six retailers. Which one doesn't belong? Only one that's kind of other than outlier, other than these four are all plus minus one percent. You know, it's Home Depot at seven percent and Amazon of course at fourteen percent, which is like quite six sigma. And the average of course is about one point six. And the good thing is Amazon's so small, right? Amazon's so small, it's only ten percent. There's no reason why you can't get to Walmart's level. Why not? Why not? And that sort of begs, still begs the question of, you know, if you look at these two guys, they're still pretty small portion of the pie. And people will always want bricks and mortar shopping. But 
But it's funny, it, you definitely can't look at Amazon, Alibaba, and eBay without looking at the rest of, of retail. So that's kind of the lesson that I've learned here. And that's going to necessitate maybe another, making even another subsector. We just call it e commerce or commerce or retailing. That could be a reasonable perspective. Well, I hope you learned something about stocks. Um, like I said, the math is actually pretty easy, right? The conceptualization of the business is the hard part. I'll upload all these files momentarily. Hope that was helpful. Should I, what should I do next? Play League of Legends? Go on Blab? Let me stop the recording. I'll upload this later. Thank you again.